the scripture reading today is found in um, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And I'll be reading from message uh, translation today. So here what I want you to do, God helping you, take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Amen. Okay, good morning. I'm going to try to see if this will get ready for us here this morning. I'd like to first thank everyone for the beautiful music. Catherine, that was nice, the songs. You know, worship is the time that we are able to come to God and give him that time separate, which is so nice to have that time. Oh. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. First of all, there's a couple things I'd just like to ask first, and that is, you are all my family. I'm so grateful you're all here. Second thing is, is as Pastor Skeek always asks, he has two things, he has three, but I'm going to ask two of them. One, he's always asked that anyone in our audience today and anyone online, please, I'm asking for prayer today that you pray that God puts his words in that woman's mouth today, okay? And the second thing is, is I want you to think through as we're talking today. Because today's sermon is really something that we've had that's going across the world. There's many people studying the same thing today. So we all want to think about it and unite in how we're doing today. So before we start, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, oh, I am so grateful that you give us the time to come and worship and to be together as a family. We are looking so forward to being in heaven as a family also. Thank you for so many things that you bless us with. Thank you for the sunshine today. And again, thank you for all of the wisdom that you give us. Help us this day to do your will. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know. Could you turn that one off? Or should I just use this mic? This one? Feels like it is. <laughs> is that all better? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right. Our message today is focused on prayer, and that's what's going to be taught. Oh, that's the international women's ministry is about prayer too. Excuse me. <laughs> Forgot something. Apparently. Good. <laughs> And the answer to prayer, because I don't play ball. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, and the, what we're going to really talk about is this idea of transforming prayer and how it does. But before we go too far into our uh, sermon this morning, I'd like to just stop and look at one characteristic specifically about prayer. So the first question is, when is the best time to pray? Anytime. Okay. It's the best time to pray morning, noon, night. Okay, let me give you a quote from <laughs> it's not going. <laughs> okay. Well, all right. Am I pointing it the wrong way or something? No. I'm trying to go forward. 
Okay. There is no time or place in which it's inappropriate to offer up a prayer or petition to God. So it's any time that we can do that. We can pray to God whenever or wherever. We don't need to kneel in a special place. We don't need to clasp our hands in a certain way. We don't need to bow our heads. All we need to do is to talk to our Father, is to open up our hearts in the privacy of our own mind. Paul tells us, basically, that we are to come boldly to the throne room of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So we need to come boldly to God. What a marvelous invitation we have that God gives to each one of us, his children. We are invited to come into his presence, into his throne room at any time. This is so unlike our earthly monarchs or heads of state where we have to have an appointment, if we can get an appointment, months usually in advance. So, but we have an almighty God, our Father, a holy God, that we can enter into his presence any time of day or night. Now that we have reaffirmed that God is always available to us and he hears and answers our prayers, let us turn to the main part of our message today. As we come to, to God in prayer, we have the power to transform our lives, our situations, and much more. God does not ask us to change before we come to him. He invites us to come just as we are. He will be the one to change us. We don't have to do the work. He tells us, so all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is in the Spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed in his glorious image. Did you know that prayer can change our lives? We've seen that happen in many, many occasions. But prayer can change situations and it can change us. As we look to meet our Father in prayer, the Holy Spirit changes us into the glorious image, and that image is the glorious image of Jesus Christ. The following story is true, but the names of the town and the country have been removed. In a small town, a certain man who was an owner of several liquor stores began construction on a new bar and to increase his business. But that store was right across the street from a local church. Now the church members were very anxious about this, and they started a campaign to block the, the, the uh, opening of this uh, new building. They also decided to meet for prayer and fasting and asking God to intercede on their behalf. Work progressed right up until the week before the opening when lightning struck the liquor store and burned it to the ground. Guess what the church folks did? <laughs> they rejoiced. They were very happy until... The owner sued the church on grounds that the church was responsible for the demise of the building, either through direct or indirect action. The church strongly denied responsibility for any connection to the building's end, and as they replied to the court. Now, at the end of the trial, the judge commented about this. He said, I don't know how I'm going to decide this case. It appears that we have a liquor store owner who believes in the power of prayer. However, we have a church congregation who does not. We'll come back to the story a little later. Whether we believe it or not, prayer does change things in our lives. I don't know about you, but I've had people praying for me, and I am so grateful for those prayers. At the time, I didn't know, but God did act, and he interceded for us. Today we're going to look at two different ways of prayer transforming us. First of all, it does change us. It changes us, it changes situations. And prayer that changes us during hard times. When we spend time with God in prayer, sharing our heart and seeking his saving power, he works in us, changing us into the image of Jesus. Each day when we come to him in prayer, he renews and changes and fills us with the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, but I need those fruits of the Holy Spirit, especially that love and that patience that comes with it. The infilling of that gives us what we need to have to face the unknown day with confidence, 
we don't know what will happen when we get up in the morning, and we don't know, nothing is positive or nothing is uh, for sure. So we have to have that confidence that we need. We are sure that we are not alone and that we can function when we have Christ walking with us. This strength is not ours, but it is God's strength, and we look, go forward with his strength. Here are some ways that God can change our lives. First of all, God gives us the cleansing and eternal life. Forgiveness, cleansing, and eternal life. John tells us, and it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We can approach the throne room of God seeking forgiveness and cleansing, asking him for a new heart to serve him and to have the confidence that God will hear and answer our prayer. The moment we ask, God starts his transforming work in our lives. He doesn't wait. As soon as we're ready, he's ready to do his work too. He removes all of our sins and cleanses us from the ugly scars of sin. We don't need to walk around feeling guilt or regret. We don't need to be ashamed for others to see us because we have these sin wounds. But when we come to our Father, confessing our sins and seeking his righteousness and his forgiveness and his cleansing, he takes our sinful heart, gives us a new, clean heart. Like David, we can say, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. This change happens when we pray because Paul reminds us it is with his own blood. Jesus entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. We can be changed through the blood of Jesus Christ and receive the promise of eternal life. What a wonderful gift that is for each of us. And again, all we have to do is come to him, and he will do the changing for us. God also changes our attitudes. I don't know about you, but I need that most of the days. <laughs> Paul writes, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. When Jesus came to this earth as a suffering servant, he did not think life was unfair. How many times do we think life is unfair? I can't go any further. This is not right. But Jesus came to this world and never thought twice about it. He surrendered his will, his mindset, his attitude to his Father. And we must do the same. When we surrender to God, we see life differently. And that's because our attitudes have changed. Naturally, we are self-centered. Selfishness kind of runs in all of our blood all the time. So we do need to be transformed into the image of Christ. He came to serve and not to be served. He came to do his Father's will. Do we have the same desire on a daily basis to serve, to see other people as other people are seen by Jesus? When we are willing to change, we will see the drug addict lying on the pavement. And rather than looking down and saying, how'd you get yourself into this mess? Our hearts will be broken and we'll see a child of God who needs help. When we we will also start to see the good in people instead of seeing their errors or talking about what they did wrong. When we are driving simply and somebody cuts us off, instead of yelling at that person, our attitudes will be changed. And what we'll say is, God, please help that person get to where they're going safely and protect everyone around them. God changes our attitudes and the circumstances to what happens in life and people that we meet, and it allows, it, he allows us to see them differently. And that's what we want to do. We have confidence that God will hear our prayers also. John writes, now this is, now this is the confidence that we have in him, 
that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Again, we don't have to do anything special. We just have to talk to him. How many times have you prayed and wondered whether God would answer your prayers? Sometimes you wait for the results to decide if God is trustworthy. But this verse clearly tells us that if we ask anything of God and it is his will, he will hear us and he will answer. How do we know God's will? Sometimes it's hard to know God's will, but the Bible does tell us God's will. We know that it's God's will for us not to kill or hurt anyone, right? We know that it's God's will that we don't lie, cheat, steal, covet. Luke 6, 35 tells us also that we are to love our enemies and do good to them. However, sometimes we don't know what God's will is. Does God want me to have a new car or buy a used car? Does God want me to go to school? Does he want me to stay home? Does he want me to get married? Does he not want me to do this? We have all these questions that we have. However, many times we just have to trust that he will guide our lives. He's in charge, and we need to trust him. Psalms 32, verses 8 and 9 also tells us, I will instruct you and teach you in the ways you should go. I will guide you with my eye. He's always watching us and keeping with us. He says, do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding. We are to have understanding. He has given us a brain to think, to understand, and to apply the principles that we have learned in his word in our lives. So we have to do some work on it ourselves to study and understand what he wants. He hears if we ask according to his will, not ours. When we pray, we trust that God, who knows the end from the beginning, or the beginning from the end, will also take care of our lives the same way. He will guide us if we will hear him and do his will. We ask, but we let God know that we are leaving the answer to his perfect will to make the final decisions for our lives. In Luke 18.1, it also says that man ought, always ought to pray and not lose heart. We are to be persistent. He wants us to continue to pray, not stop praying. And we can't give up. So we want to keep going with our prayers. God doesn't tire of our prayers either. He's willing to listen to any time. God's time is not the same as ours also. Prayers are answered. However, we've got to be patient and know that it's in God's time. Because again, he's working with many different people in many different situations. So we don't know all the work that he has to do. And I don't know about you, if you think about working with other people, it's kind of difficult sometimes. So he have, we have to be patient with him and believe that God knows best. Prayer teaches me also to look to God and not to myself. In Acts 8, we find a story of Simon the sorcerer. What he did amazed people, but it wasn't from God. Simon saw the power of God was revealed through Peter, John, and Philip, and he also wanted to perform those miracles that were true miracles. But Peter rebuked Simon and said, your money perished with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased. Simon wanted power of God to be used for his own selfish reasons, not for the glory of God. He wanted people to give him praise for what he did. Like Simon, we need to realize that only God can give the help that we need. Only God can change our lives. We cannot do it for ourselves, and no man can do it for us. It is not about what I can do. It is not about what I can do. It is about what God can do in and through me. Most important part of this, I see, is to help and bless others. It's not about me. It's about what God needs me to do. Prayer also renews my mind. Paul writes, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 
And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Again, he's looking for us to change and to transform, and as we said earlier, into the likeness of Christ. By the renewing of our minds, that we may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. One of the remarkable things about prayer is that prayer restores our mind. Only God can change the way we think about life, about ourselves, about others, about the future, about anything that's going on. Only God can give us the hope, the courage, and peace we need to live in this world. When we come to God in prayer, he renews and restores our minds. As we surrender our lives to God each day in prayer, he begins to transform our transforming work that begins with our mind. It is part of our mind. We have to think of our mind and know that our thoughts need to be reflective of Christ. Our mind makes our decisions, our judgments, and our choices. Three big things that help us in life all the way around. What we decide, what we see as judgments, and what our choices are. God reveals his power in our prayer's life also. James tells us the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. When we pray with a heart submitted to God, he will act. We will see his power in our lives, and we will know that God's power is real. Then we can share what he has done so others will know what God can do and that, first of all, he is true. He is real, and he does answer our prayers. Think of the many times in the Bible when God revealed his power because of prayer and how it changed the lives of the people involved. Elijah on Mount Carmel, he prayed, and God rained down fire, and it consumed an altar, water-laden altar filled with water, and it just went up in fire because of his prayer. I think the many people who saw that were very astonished. Or the prophet Elisha, when surrounded by the Syrian army in the city of Dothan, his servant was afraid. You can see why. He's surrounded by the Syrians. But Elisha prayed to God to save them and to open up the servant's eyes. And God answered that prayer. And the servant saw the invisible army of angels surrounding the entire Syrian army. Can you imagine how this revelation changed his attitude towards God? How he was revealing God's power to Elisha's servant. The Bible is filled with such stories. God showed his power in Bible times, and he continues to show in our lives the same power. However, we must recognize the working of God in our lives in both small and big ways. Sometimes we pray and we don't want to recognize what God does, but we have to think about what that is. In difficult times, prayer changes, and sometimes God must allow us to face these difficult times so that we can really know that he is the source of all help for us. In these trying times, we learn to depend fully on God, our Father. God is waiting to hear us cry out to him sometimes and say, Father, I need you. I can't do this on my own. These are the times when God increases our faith and changes us. Let us look at two Bible stories now about prayer that changed the lives of people during very difficult times for them. The first story is about a woman. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, we find the story of Hannah, a woman of great distress and emotional pain. Starting in verse 6, it says, And she and her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. It was hard enough for her not to be able to have children, but to have somebody antagonizing you about it all the time, that's got to have been a very difficult situation. Paniah, the second wife of Hannah's husband, Elkanah, 
tormented Hannah because she was childless. When Hannah could no longer handle the taunts, she went to God and cried out to him. Verse 10 says, she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Her distress was so great that Eli, the priest, who was sitting at the entrance, thought she was drunk. Can you imagine the look on her face as she prayed to God to help her with this dilemma that she was in. When in distress, we do not consider how we look or what others may say. We are in God's throne room, and the conversation is between us and our Heavenly Father, and it is personal. God's heart went out to Hannah, and he heard her cries, and he answered her prayer. He gave her Samuel the son that she had prayed for. She had promised God that she would give that child to serve him in the temple, and she kept her promise. Think about that also, how hard it would have been to give up that son that she prayed so hard for. But she was true to her word. Her life was changed from sorrow to great joy, but God did not stop there. He also blessed her with three sons and two more daughters according to 1 Samuel 2, 21. Hannah's life changed, and I'm sure the lives of Elkan, her husband, and Pania also changed. Prayer changes situations, and it does change people. In Acts 12, we find another story about two of Jesus' disciples, James and Peter. First, King Herod killed James, the brother of John. That pleased the Jews so much that Herod decided he would imprison Peter with the idea that he would also be killed soon. The church had a prayer meeting in the home of Mary, the mother of Mark, to pray for Peter's release. And God heard their prayers also, and he answered them. He sent an angel to guide and safely bring Peter to the home of Mary, where the believers were. In verse 13, it says, Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and the service servant named Rhoda answered the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was overjoyed and ran back without opening and exclaimed, Peter's at the door! And she told them, Peter's here, Peter's here, she's all excited. Verse 15, though, tells us the reaction of the people who were praying for Peter's release. You're out of your mind, they told her. When you kept, and then she kept insisting that it was so. They said, it must be an angel. And again, they were praying for God to release Peter. However, they didn't believe that God was going to answer those prayers. The reaction of believers, the, the believers when Rhoda told them to Peter's was very interesting and very unbelievable, since this is what they really were looking for. Wasn't it what they wanted, yet they doubted over and over that Peter was not at the gate? This reminds me of the story we started at the beginning of this message, the liquor store owner and the church members. When we pray, do we believe God will answer? And when God answers, do we believe he answered, or do we try to figure out a more concrete or logical answer, never really believing what God did for us? Do you remember the store? Do we resemble the store owner who believed that the church members' prayers were responsible for the store burning down? Or do we look like the church members who denied their prayers? had anything to do with the store burning down. I can't imagine what it was for that court and how those people could have, at some point, claimed that their prayers did have something to do with that and how many people would have started to believe in prayer. Each day when we wake up, do we wait until the trials come to cry out to God to do and to seek for what the day will bring? Or do we seek him on a daily basis 
in prayer, asking for his strength, his joy, his courage to face whatever the day may bring. Before we end this message this morning, Mary's going to read an important quote from the steps of Christ for us this morning. There is no time or place in which it is. Each day when we wake up, do we wait until trials come before we cry out to God, or do we seek Him each day in prayer? asking for his strength, his joy, his courage to face whatever the day may bring. Before we end this message, no, oh, wait. Hey, me, I messed up. There is no, yeah, sorry. There is no time or place in which it is inappropriate to offer up a petition to God. There is nothing that can prevent us from lifting our hearts in the spirit of earnest prayer, in the crowds on the street, in the midst of a business engagement, when we are all alone and feeling rejected by others. We may send up a petition to God and plead for divine guidance and help, as did Nehemiah when he made his request before King Exerces. A closet of communion, a closet of communion may be found whenever we are, wherever we are. We should have the door of our heart open continually and our invitation going up that Jesus may come and abide as a heavenly guest in the soul. Although there may be a tainted, corrupt atmosphere around us, we need not breathe its mizma, tainted air, but may live in the pure air of heaven. We may close every door to impure imaginings and unholy thoughts by lifting the soul into the presence of God through sincere prayer. Those whose hearts are open to receive the support and blessing of God will walk in a holier atmosphere than that of earth and will have constant communion with heaven. Ellen G. White, Steps to Christ, page 20, uh, 99. Mary, when you think about that, we're thinking about, again, how Christ gives us the opportunity to feel a little bit of heaven here as we go along. We are encouraged to talk to our Father at any time and all times. Nothing can prevent us from taking, talking to our Father. It is not a matter of where we are. We can choose, we can close our eyes. We can keep our eyes open. We can talk to him anyway and any time. The doorway to the throne room, again, is open all the time. God is always available to us. All we need to do to enter is to enter boldly and to tell him everything that brings us joy as well as sorrow. He is willing to hear us and rejoice with us, to sorrow with us. He is always present. His throne room door is never closed. We do not need to clean ourselves in order to come before him. God cleans us. He does that work. We do not need to have our lives in order. He will order our lives for us. We do not need to be sinless when we come to God because he's the one who cleanses us and he gives us a new heart and a mind like Jesus. What we must do to be changed into the image of Christ is simple. All we need to do is come. We come to him 
And according to Philippians 1, verse 6, we come to the foot of his throne, being confident that this very thing that he has done, he has begun a good work in you, will be complete it, and, and will complete it till the end of the day when Jesus Christ God has promised, and he will do it. What about you today? Are you ready to ask God to renew your heart, your mind, and your life today? We all have regrets in our lives, and we all have things that we wish that we didn't do, or things we didn't say, things, decisions that we didn't make. But in the throne room, in God's throne room, there is hope for a new beginning. If you are yearning, for God to change your life. Please stand with me today as we pray for our loving Father. Let us bow our heads. Lord, we come to you in prayer this morning. We surrender our lives, our wills, to you. For we want to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We ask that you help us grow in our prayer life, that we may see how you intercede for us. You guide us, you help us through every moment of every breath. Your mercy, we can come to you, to your throne room, and receive your grace and to help us in our times of need. We want to be transformed to serve as you want us to, Lord. Let us Focus on your will and not ourselves, so we may receive your continuous blessings. Open our eyes that we may see your glory in every day, in every person, in every action that we have. This is what we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.